To understand the new Phoenix program, it is necessary to begin at the beginning of U.S. government human experimentation, the Manhattan Project. At dawn on July 16, 1945, the Trinity site witnessed the detonation of the device codenamed Gadget. The remaining two devices, named Little Boy and Fat Man, were used on Hiroshima and Nagasaki on August 6th and 9th, killing approximately 200,000 people. World War II terror bombing of civilians began with the London Blitz, killing 30,000 people, and culminated in the firebombing of Dresden, Germany, and Tokyo. Napalm was used in 1,000 plane raids that incinerated approximately 200,000 people. The atomic bomb did not add to the scale of mass murder of civilian populations, but it certainly made it more efficient. Many of the scientists were appalled at the result. Some had urged a demonstration shot. The scientists declared publicly that the U.S. possessed only a few years' head start before another nation followed suit. Many of the scientists and some generals advocated international control and the eventual banning of nuclear weapons. Those that tried to head off a nuclear arms race in the end failed, as events and personalities took on a momentum of their own. Edward Teller advocated the super-heavy, the hydrogen bomb. Oppenheimer objected to the development of the hydrogen bomb and stated that these were genocidal weapons. He was promptly replaced. Teller assumed the scientific leadership of the weapons program and remained influential for the entire Cold War. The largest hydrogen bomb ever tested by the U.S. was around 40 megatons. 2,000 times more powerful than the 20 kiloton Hiroshima bomb. The nuclear arms race that followed has resulted in the doctrine of MAD, mutually assured destruction. If either the U.S. or USSR launched any or all of their half of the 20,000 nuclear weapons they have aimed at each other, then they can rest assured that they too would be completely destroyed in a retaliatory strike. The nuclear arms race consumed much of the wealth of the U.S., leaving the civilian population living in the very real fear that the world could end in a matter of minutes. In 1943, the first human test subjects would be used without their knowledge or consent. American citizens and hospitals began to receive plutonium or other forms of radiation treatments that had no therapeutic value. All of the experiments were conducted for the express purpose of answering the unknowns. How much radiation could kill a man? Could blood tests detect exposure? Are there treatments for exposure? Long before radiological warfare was used on enemy populations in war, it was purposely tested on American civilians. By 1945, the war was over, but these questions remained unanswered, and the experiments would continue in secret for the next 30 years. The School of Aviation Medicine in San Antonio, Texas, quietly began to do the test for the Air Force. Military officials did not object to the use of cancer patients, but many of these people were not very ill or had been misdiagnosed. Several of the people injected with plutonium had been diagnosed as having cancer when they did not. Many of the others were not cancer patients, but suffered from illnesses such as hemophilia, scleroderma, or Cushing's disease. These errors were repeated in the total body irradiation experiments that were sponsored by the military. Many of the cancer patients had been well enough to work or, and live normally. A lethal dose of radiation is 350 rad. After doses of 100 to 2,000 rad, many patients died within days or weeks from radiation poisoning. Those that lived were often debilitated and in constant pain. Nazi scientists were employed at Randolph Air Force Base in San Antonio and involved in these lethal experiments. These were just a few of the thousands of Nazi scientists who had secretly been smuggled into the U.S. under Operation Paperclip to help the U.S. destroy the USSR. Dr. Hubertus Strughold was their intellectual and spiritual leader in radiation studies. He brought in Dr. Herbert Gerstner, who used prisoners during the war to study at what point human hearing is completely destroyed due to shelling and to study the exact cause of death in cases of electrocution. These men had all experimented on prisoners in concentration camps and were now in San Antonio doing lethal radiation experiments on American citizens for the military.
Elmer Allen was designated experimental test subject Cal-13. On July 18, 1947, in a San Francisco hospital, he was injected with plutonium in the left leg. Three days later, the leg was amputated at mid-thigh. Elmer was a porter for the Pullman Company who injured his leg while stepping off a train. He was diagnosed with a fracture that developed into a cyst. The first test for cancer was negative. A second test indicated cancer. Unable to work after the amputation, he was forced to return to Italy, Texas with his wife and three children. His wife recalled that he began having epileptic seizures. Quote, he would chew through the spoon, his tongue, too. Elmer began drinking heavily and told his best friend that he had been used as a guinea pig, but no one, not even his family doctor, believed him. The doctor later diagnosed him as a paranoid schizophrenic. During an effort to collect the bodies of the people injected with plutonium, it was discovered to their amazement that four of them were still alive. One year after Elmer's death, the family was contacted by a reporter and learned that Elmer had been a human experimental subject and the family had been lied to for 44 years. Elmer Allen died in 1991. His headstone reads Elmer Allen, 1911-1947, Cal 13, 1947-1991, one of America's nuclear guinea pigs. I hope you will understand that just as Jewish fathers were placed in the ovens at Auschwitz, my father, Elmer Allen, was placed in his own private oven here in the United States of America. He was left there for 44 years, and the scientist occasionally took a peek inside to see if he was still alive. His survivors are pledged to tell the truth about this experiment for the next 50 or even 100 years if necessary, so that future generations will have more than lies, half-truths, and inconclusive reports when attempting to recount this real-life horror story.